Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for the Studium Generale event. My name, is and my name is Andrea Gammon, and I'm Assistant Professor in Ethics and Philosophy of Technology um, here at TU Delft. And I'm moderating the event tonight. I'm not used to this. Uh, yeah, so uh, welcome. We hope this will be an interactive event. Um, I'll be asking you at different points in the evening for questions that you have for our speakers. Um, we're discussing, or our three speakers to join us will be discussing nuclear energy from different vantages. So uh, we have Benham Taibi, um, Romy Decker, and an artist, Tinika Van Veen. Um, I'll introduce them individually in a few moments when they, before, they, um, before they present their talk. Um, but first, what I want to do is share some polling that was done by Studium Generale um, uh, over questions related to nuclear energy. So I'm not sure if I'm doing this correctly. Yeah. So first, I'll show you the question. Maybe someone can hazard a guess. And then I'll show you the answers that were given by um, respondents to the poll ahead of time. So the first question is, how much radioactive waste does the Netherlands produce per year? Any guesses from current audience? Five? Five shipping containers worth of waste. Okay. The actual answer is 16, so it's a bit, bit larger. Um, how much radioactive waste does the world produce per year? Any other guesses? Okay, I'm too afraid of getting it wrong. 12,000 <laughs> tons per year. I understand. I don't, I don't want to guess. <laughs> Ah, choose the middle one. Okay, I'm not sure. Um, maybe, uh, maybe we can test this. Which percentage of nuclear waste stays radioactive for a long time? A long time is not very specific, but <laughs> if it's the if the pattern holds in, it's five. Any guesses? Uh, Venom says one, and he's right. So it's only one percent, but it's <laughs> for a very long time. Maybe we can think about that in specific ways uh, with our speakers. Um, now there are some questions more about perceptions around nuclear waste rather than, than the numbers. How do you feel about nuclear waste? Maybe not wrong answers here. Does anyone from the audience here want to register? A Does anyone feel like it's perfectly <laughs> safe? Uh, This was the results from the polling beforehand. Risky but necessary is maybe how most people feel, I would guess. Some people, five, vote, five people believe it's perfectly safe. Should we build more nuclear pl power plants? This is a live question in the Netherlands right now, of course. I see, not, I see nods, but I don't know if that means yes, that's right, or yes, we should build more. Um, actually, the people who are polled really are in favor of building more plants. So I think the, the current proposal is to keep the Borsela plant open longer and then build two additional plants. So um, that's something that maybe we'll discuss tonight. Who bears, and this is the final question, I believe who, this is maybe the m most philosophical question uh, of these and um, maybe a framing question for, for this event. Who bears the responsibility for nuclear waste? I don't have answers, I don't have poll answers to this. I have two sample answers, but I'd also be interested to hear ideas from this group of people. Is this our responsibility now? Yeah, sorry, I have to. Currently, I think it's the government of each country that has to be sh ensure that the waste is stored safely and pay for it not the company who generates the electricity from nuclear power, but the company. So it's a yeah, country or na national responsibility rather than the, the companies producing it. Um, the, there are two responses that we're sharing here, sort of two different kinds of, yeah, we do is very general, I think, and maybe we, <laughs> we have that intuition, but then also those who produce it. So I think maybe this could this might refer specifically to these companies or to countries. Um, I, would, I think maybe we should keep this question in mind as we have our speakers, and maybe we can come back to this at the end. Um, I'm especially interested to 
to see if your intuitions or your ideas about this change on the basis of the, the talks we'll hear and the discussion that we can have. So thanks for that. Um, now I'm going to, m oh, I wanna one more thing I want to say is to let you know about the format that we'll be using. So we have three speakers. Um, they'll each speak for about 10 minutes and then we'll ask for one question after each speaker um, from you all, or if not from you, then I'll come up with one, but it would be best if it were from you. Um, and then we'll have a break for 10 minutes or so, and then we'll have more of a panel discussion where we can ask more questions. So there's not just one question per speaker, but that's just the initial um, round, and then we'll have a, a panel discussion um, based on your questions, comments, points. Um, so yeah, so that's the format. Let me introduce our speakers now. Our first speaker is Benham Tybee. Benham works at TU Delft, where he's full professor of energy and climate ethics and scientific director of the Safety and Security Institute. He leads TU Delft's campus in The Hague, which aims to bring engineering knowledge closer to the heart of public policy and politics in the Netherlands. And he'll be speaking about a, a, a trip he's made to Fukushima in the past, in 2017, I believe. Okay, welcome, Benham. Can I get the, if I get the, the remote control, please? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea, for the, the kind introduction. Thank you for being here. Um, I will be indeed speaking uh, about an, uh, an experience of my own when I was uh, visiting uh, a Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi, actually, to be more exact, because there are different Fukushimas around uh, that area. Um, and this is based on sort of a couple of photos and, and, and experiences that I have and I'm bringing myself and I thought might be interesting to share here with you. So um, I'm talking about Fukushima, Fukushima and radioactive contamination. And as the question, we're sort of alluding to it. There is a radioactive waste, there is nuclear waste. Those are two separate things. Radioactive waste, much more sort of in the terms of magnitude, a lot larger than nuclear waste coming from inside a nuclear reactor or associated with nuclear energy production, waste management. So, um, and I'm going to sort of pose the question about Fukushima and radioactive contamination, whether that would be, or that is a case against nuclear energy. So I'll try to put it against the sort of the backdrop of uh, ongoing development uh, in Europe, but also in Japan, worldwide, you could say. First of all, any idea what you're seeing on, a, on this picture? Any thought? Soil, yes. This is contaminated soy. These are huge bags, bag one by one by one, one qu cubic meter of contaminated soy. And there's been a lot of that in Fukushima. Before I went to Fukushima, even as someone who's working in this field, I thought that the biggest problem Japan is facing at that moment, this is a visit in 2017. I thought that the biggest problem Japan is facing is dealing with containing the reactor or the reactors that were damaged. Three reactors were substantially damaged. So my guess was that they are having a hard time containing that. That was not the case. Containing of the damaged reactors was not the biggest issue, perhaps the first couple of days. Uh, but that bit was organized very well. What was very problematic was this. These blue bags or green bags, different colors you saw along the road. A lot of those bags you found actually in Japan. And this was a trip that um, we made together with colleagues from International Commission on Radiological Protection. We were working on a publication that was forthcoming actually later this year on a low level and intermediate level radioactive waste management. So not the 1%, actually the other 99%, which is the largest in magnitude, but a lot of focus, especially in the, my literature, in the ethics literature, is about the 1% because it's long lived, it's very dangerous, it's very difficult to get rid of, so a lot of attention goes there, and that's a missed opportunity because we need to also talk about the 99%. So basically, this was a, f a visit that we brought there, and the Japanese government invited us to show around, show us around, and uh, show us what, how they were dealing with contaminated soil, because that was a and still is a major problem in Japan. What happened after the Fukushima accident was that a lot of contamination ended up in the air that came out with rain or with wind all around in the region, a pretty large region. So the moment that they could release region and make it again inhabitable, they need to make sure that there are no sources of radiation available there. That could be problematic for public health. So what they did was basically scrapping off a layer of the, the ground, depending on actually their areas, and, 
and trying to get rid of the waste and making sort of instructing people to clean out their houses and their roofs and, and, and their yards and everything, especially everything that has been exposed to the open air, and to get rid of it in the huge bags that the government provided this. Who's responsible for the waste is from a legal perspective. It was actually the prefecture government that was taking care of that and the national government in Japan. They were very much on top of this, so they provided people with those bags. So make sure you clean your own house, you clean your own yard, your own roof, because everything that remains could come down with rain again, could affect you, could affect your health, your children's health. Um, so put it in the backyard, let, literally, and we'll, we'll collect it. And they did. A lot of that was collected as a result of which there were millions of these blue or green bags or collected just all around the region. A lot was still there. When you were traveling actually through a region, 2017, I'm talking about seven years, seven ha six and a half years, I'm sorry, after the accident, a lot of those bags were still in the backyards and needed to be collected. And a lot of them were brought to these kind of sort uh, intermediate or improvised places, you could say, and they were backed and rebacked because the whole idea is you need to collect that soil and you need to make sure that water doesn't seep through and the radiation doesn't seep through the earth because that could contaminate actually the water uh, the water surface, which is absolutely what you want to have, because at the end, it could be also sort of, that is the water that could come up to the surface that we could drink, that animals could drink, animals that we might eat later, etc., etc. So basically, they did a lot of rebagging and rebagging, and at the end of it, they needed to actually sort of put everything in, I think, three, four, five layers of bagging they do in these bags that went, uh, were collected again, depending on the, the particles that were in the soil. And depending on that, they decided what to do with it. A part of the reason, this is us basically measuring the radiation or just like playing around with the Ge uh, 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 Geiger counter, not really measuring anything uh, they were showing us around, but you could see for yourself that different bags would have different radiation levels. Again, very much depending on what particle is in it. Certain high radiation levels were not there, were immediately actually removed, had to deal with as, as nuclear waste, had to go to actually the geolo geological places for later, dealt with as something very dangerous. Uh, others uh, were basically low level or intermediate level waste, and those are the lower levels of waste that they need to soil, they need to do something with. So you saw a lot of these kind of images. And another problem that they were encountering was, and again, something that I learned when I was traveling through that region, is that it's a, a super hilly region. So there are just, there are no straight roads. Uh, big uh, cars or big, big trucks cannot drive there. So at best, you could uh, sort of move around six to eight of these uh, one cubic meter uh, contaminated soil, say around eight, nine tons of that, uh, which means that all those millions of bags that need to be traveled around or moved around from different places, actually, that took a lot of these kind of sort of logistics to make sure that you at least collect and again move around and make sure that you do something with it. So. These are also images. This is the schoolyard, uh, because the first days of after the accident, they needed a lot of empty spaces that were used for collecting soil and just dumping it there, because there is not much you could do at that moment, where you need to collect it later, and need to sort of categorize it based on the radiation levels, and need to deal with it. So a lot of these actually sort of being, being again, collected, bagged, and rebagged, and shipped. And again, this is just, uh, you could easily see that walking around, you're dealing with different radiation levels. And these came to these kind of improvised facilities. Um, this is Data City on the background, I think around 100 kilometers from uh, where the accident took place, one of the big cities in Japan. And you see that a lot of, in all those hills around the area, wherever they could find some place, they, these bags were sort of positioned temporarily, and you need to deal with it one way or the other. And one of the reasons they were actually showing us around was they were showing us some experiment on how to deal with it, because Japan is, a, is an island with no natural resources, no substantial resources. Everything is a resource on an island. Also, soil is a resource. So you, could just get, you can't just get rid of it as waste. You need to reuse it somehow. One of the things that we're considering, the first one of the first things that were mentioned was to use it as a lower source of agricultural land. That sort of engendered a lot of controversy in Japan and outside Japan. They sort of forgot about that idea. And the, the new idea was to reuse it as uh, the first layer of uh, infrastructure for, for building roads. Use it as one of the layers for building roads. So you're reusing it one way or the other. And again, this is the least dangerous type. This, but still, you can just use it as soil. Still, there is some radiation uh, that, that you need to sort of get rid of 
and most of that radiation is uh, the type of the type that will sort of deactivate itself in pretty short time. But still, you can't deal with it as just soil. It's contaminated. Um, nuclear disaster or not, uh, humor never ceases. So when you walk through those millions of, I mean, in our case, thousands of actually bags that you could see, you could see a lot of these kind of funny features or funny smileys that, uh, that, that radiation workers or workers that were actually leaving behind. Um, so you saw a lot of these kind of images. This was us uh, to wrap up this bit. Uh, this was actually, this is the commission. It is also the conference that the ICRP organized and um, there might be a minor problem with this photo. Uh, I just thought, I, I, I don't. <laughs> a manual indeed, yes. When I was putting that as hashtag gender gap 2017, the organizers weren't too happy. Um, but back to actually the question. What a kind of question, what kind of problem is uh, the, the Fukushima problem? It's a technical problem indeed. As engineers at this university, we understand and we sort of approach things very much a technical problem. Uh, we need to find a technical solution to deal with the radiation, to sort of uh, disassemble or, or uh, isolate the radiation resources that need to be dealt with as waste, and we need to solve or take care of the rest of it. It is a logistics problem. Again, it could also be very important how we move around and how fast we could move around those bags. One of the reasons there was still a lot left over, and if I may believe actually the news resources say that there is still a lot left over, it's because it's also a logistic problem, a huge logistic problem for Japan. Is it a policy and governance problem? <laughs> of course, because they need to come up with some kind of measures to deal with it. Um, and you need to, they need to also sort of uh, uh, accommodate uh, new facilities, come up with ways, regulate it in a way that you could actually reuse that soil as, uh, as construction uh, material or any other way. It is a radiation pro a protection problem. Because again, even small dose of radiation, it needs to be regulated. It should be clear how long you're being exposed as an individual, as a society, to what levels of radiation, et cetera, et cetera. Is it also an ethical problem? Of course it is. And that goes to the core of actually the session here. And because whose responsibility is it? We could say that it's sort of the, the legal responsibility of the government, the local government, the regional or the national government, but it's also an issue that, that, that is very crucial in this particular case, but also in general. How do we deal with our waste? Because we could deal with it nationally, we could deal with it internationally. Another proposal that doesn't get a lot of attention, but still on the table of a lot of policy making, also in the Netherlands. Netherlands is officially following a dual use policy, a uh, du dual path policy, dual, what is it called? Dual, dual, strategy. dual strategy policy, thank you very much which basically means that you need to facilitate your own ho uh, geological disposal, but you are considering as a country also an international possibility. So there is this thing that could come, could happen between now and a couple of tens of years, European disposal facility, which means that small countries, small in the amount of nuclear waste, uh, could join together and dispose of it together. I just wanted to show this problem, not only as a technical, but essentially also as an ethical problem, the problem of waste. A couple more slides and I'm wrapping up. Any idea what you're seeing here? This was, these are radiation levels that were being communicated. It's the first thing actually you saw when you exited the, uh, the Shinkansen station, the, the, the world's fastest train, if I may believe that. Beautiful trains. Uh, you saw just behind the station, you saw the radiation levels being communicated real time. And here it was chalked up every now and then. And basically the message here is that the radiation level is very low substantially lower than you're allowed to be exposed to. So this is micro sievert per hour. Radiation is always a function of time. Just by way of comparison, that's 0.135 micro sievert uh, per hour, which is in terms of millisievert by year, per year, which is how we regulate radiation is 1.183 micro sievert per year. The legal, uh, I think in the Netherlands also, but in many countries, I, if I recall correctly also in the Netherlands is 2.5 millisievert per year. So basically the Japanese government was also communicating that radiation levels are lower than what they could be legally speaking. So there is no uh, immediate danger for population to be sort of there. This was after many uh, people were actually went back. Um, just by way of comparison, here we are passing actually a couple of hundreds of meters of the uh, damaged reactors. On the right side is the ocean and we are passing by the reactor and you see that the radiation level go up to 3.4 microsievert per hour, which amounts to almost 30 millisievert per hour, which is substantially more than it's legally allowed. So here the, re the recommendation was just drive through. 
you're being exposed for a short period of time, probably nothing will happen. It's just you're safe to drive through. But don't stop, don't get out of the car. Definitely not if you're not protected. Is this a case against uh, nuclear energy to wrap up? Well, some people argued immediately after Fukushima, this is the end of the nuclear era. I think it was just a myopic argument because you, you couldn't look sufficiently what was happening in the rest of the world. Japan immediately phased out or sort of stopped the reactors, 50 something reactors. But that was not something that happened elsewhere in the world, except perhaps in Germany and some other countries. But Germany wasn't a very big nuclear country from the beginning, with 17 reactors, half of which immediately shut down under the Angela Merkel's administration. It was an important political decision, but yet not a very major decision in terms of nuclear impact. Um, and what we see here is actually that after the war in Ukraine, there is a double effect on nuclear energy. On the one side, the fact that, uh, that Russian forces took over the Zaporizhia nuclear reactor nuclear power plant actually, with seven reactors, Europe's largest power plant. It engendered a lot of sort of negative feelings about are these things built to withstand actually a war? Are they built for those war zones? What if something happens? These are easy targets to be attacked. At the same time, we saw the gas prices uh, going high. So the new political reality that we are depending a lot on gas. And again, that gave a push towards more approval for nuclear energy. So it's interesting to see that the same Germany that whole Europe, but may perhaps also in other parts of the world, we're looking at the Germany's phasing out nuclear energy, is reconsidering that decision, at least for the ta last two reactors that haven't been shut down yet. They were supposed to be shut down in December, but very likely they will still online for a few, at least a couple more months to deal with the gas crisis right now. And to wrap up, the same Japan that actually phased out nuclear reactor in 2011, immediately after the accident happened, is reconsidering it. Nine reactors are right now online, if I may uh, believe the most recent numbers I looked up today. Um, and Japan is counting on zero emission by 2050. And they are moving to 2030 and calculating that renewable energies and nuclear energy needs to sort of take over the gas dependence. Because immediately after the phase out, they were becoming hugely dependent on natural gas being imported. And because of the, 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 the dependency on gas, partially Russian gas, by the way, and the fact that Japan is also joining uh, the international sanctions against Russia, things have changed substantially the last couple of uh, uh, weeks and months. So Japan is counting now, counting on, I think, 20-something percent nuclear energy by 2030, which means going up to about 30 reactors, and on even more amounts of percentages of nuclear energy by 2050, the zero emission year, which will amount to about 50 reactors, which is exactly the sort of the pre-Fukushima number of reactors. Just to show you, to make the circle round, we started from actually sort of phasing down, shutting down all the reactors in Japan, and it looks like they are going back to pre-Fukushima time 10 years ago. I will leave it at that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Benham. So we have time for one question, and again, there will be more time later on, but one question following on Benham's, wow, really interesting uh, talk. Yeah. Wait, let me give this to you. Hello, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering from an ethical perspective, don't you find that nuclear waste is instead very convenient with respect to chemical waste? Because we have the possibility to have detectors which actually give us very easily, they'll say the amount of nuclear waste or radioactivity, which is certainly is not possible for a lot of chemical waste that comes from uh, siderurgic plants, for example, in Italy, you have this huge problem in the south, or for mining. So uh, becoming uh, like the bad part of nuclear, it's still better than the bad part for, of a, a lot of other technologies, making it like a less of a logistical problem than the logistical problem to handle with chemicals because you have to analyze the samples of the ground a lot of times, much more longer and complicated. We are simply not dealing with the chemicals as much as with the nuclear. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, some people argue that nuclear waste is getting increasingly, uh, increasingly more attention than other type of waste, which is indeed true. Because, uh, for instance, the heavy metals uh, from becoming chemical waste, still because nuclear waste is also chemical waste, it's a specif specific kind of chemical waste. Uh, and that is indeed, that might be true because there is sort of, there is, there is some, some sort of mystic aspect into it, radiation, we can observe it, but it can harm us, uh, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. 
But at the same time, I'm not sure if we would actually sort of, I would draw such comparisons. I think uh, this is something that we need to deal with anyway, chemical waste, heavy metals, or other type of waste we need to deal with also. So if not being dealt with properly there, it doesn't justify anything here and the other way around. Um, I think, though, that we need to think about the future of nuclear energy in terms of risk versus risk frameworks, because it's just some kind of risk we are producing here, introducing here, if Japan goes back to the 15 reactors, well, the likelihood of an accident will increase also, even though we are improving the reactors, but we need to accept that these kind of accidents happen, and they will always probably happen in the future too, because we're dealing with substantially, increasingly complex systems with a lot of interactions, and then you saw a lot of that also in Japan accident. For instance, the reactor that was not operational caused the largest damage, because there was a venting uh, the system that was connected between two reactors. The affected reactor that was producing hydrogen sort of pumped the hydrogen into the other reactor that wasn't even operational, but that was the biggest accident, that it was the reactor that was hosting the pools with the, 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 the spent fuel. So that was about the time that, uh, that the Japanese government were cons was thinking about evacuating even to, uh, Tokyo, which would have amounted to probably huge numbers of deaths only as a result of evacuation. Um, so these are the systems that, that are very complex. We will anticipate, we do anticipate what we need to also understand that things might go wrong. So yet, this is a, some people argue at this moment, a solution, for instance, for dealing with climate change and the risks associated with climate change. So we are dealing with the future of energy and energy transition in, in sort of risk versus risk versus risk framework. And that's how we need to assess, ethically speaking, how we think about the future of nuclear energy. Jin. Thank you for the question and, and, and answer, and we'll have more time as well afterwards. Um, but next, we have uh, Tinika von Vane. And are you going to share a video of uh, an art installation or an art piece of yours? But you'll also give a talk to yeah, a little. Uh, as an introduction, so, okay. so you can better maybe understand what you're going to see. And of course, I'm a visual artist, so my film is in fact, the thing I want to say, but uh, I thought it would be nice to talk a little bit about it. So, well, I will do. Okay, should I, I'll just introduce you a little, yes. I just wasn't yes. sure. So Tineke is a, an artist based in, the, in Den Haag. Um, her most recent work concerns disturbances in the relationships between humans and the environment. And she works specifically, maybe not exclusively, but I think with the work you'll talk about today, in sites of these disturbances. So for instance, in a residency also in Fukushima, um, or also in France, where you've worked in um, sites where atomic bombs were developed in the 1960s. And her work explores concepts of safety and vulnerability and resilience. So let's please thank welcome you. Tinika. Well, thank you, you all come here uh, to, to listen to us because I think it's a very uh, important subject. Um, so, and giving me the opportunity to participate in this event. Um, well, I'm a visual artist, like she told, and I made a film in Settling Dust. I also made a film in 2015 in Japan on the same topic as uh, Benham already told you, and that was a very short experimental film, um, because I think in the art you can show in a different way what is going on as, and well, participating with the, with the science is, is very important. Um, I made this film not alone. I did it with Barbara Prezai. She studied here in uh, the TU Delft uh, for um, landscape architecture uh, for a master, and now she's doing a PhD uh, in uh, Scotland. Uh, she's a Slovenian uh, uh, person. And I met her after uh, we met each other uh, about this subject. Nuclear waste is an urgent topic. How can we give next generations a safe world to survive in and to live in? And like yesterday in the VPRO Tegelicht uh, program, I don't know if you saw it from Glenn Albrecht. He's an uh, environmental philosopher, said we have to change from the Anthropocene to, to the, and was a new word he invented, the uh, symbiocene. Uh, it's a new era in which people, nature and technology create a new balance together. And Unsettling Dust, the film explores the lived bodily experience of radiation by focusing on the relationship between post-nuclear landscapes, radioactive dust and breathing. It draws attention to Forte Fosjour, a former nuclear weapon testing site on the outskirts of Paris. 
20 kilometers outside of Paris and ask what it means to be living with the threat of contagion. The starting point of the art project goes back to 2016 with our introduction to Forte Fauchure. And Forte Fauchure was once built uh, to defend uh, Paris uh, around the end of the 19th century. But from 1955 till 1997, uh, the fort was used by France Atomic Energy Commission. The site was used for experiments that focused on the study of explosives. I think more than 3,000 took place in the open air. And the dynamic behavior of shock-loaded materials, including natural and depleted uranium. It was here where the core components of the country's first atomic bomb were developed. But finally, the Gerboise Bleu, all those atomic bombs have beautiful names, was detonated in the Algerian desert. Uh, and they are still struggling with all the ways that is uh, there. Well, it is difficult to determine precise levels of contamination and risk associated with the site. It is fair to say that the total area of 45 hectares remains marked by natural and depleted uranium up to this day. The current public health concerns primarily stem for air from airborne, not surface contamination, with radioactive dust being the site's most significant hazard. Well, since the beginning of our work on the film, we have witnessed the importance of the project increasing, from the resurgence of local activism in Fauchure to the broader political discussion surrounding nuclear energy and with the COVID pandemic from the last years to the global focus on the atmospheres we inhabit. The war in Ukraine sadly makes the topic of the nuclear even more current. We believe unsettling dust, the film, brings the, these growing concerns together and locates them within our immediate vicinity where they can be felt and acted upon. With the focus on breathing and the ways nuclear contamination freely travels across space and time, the project aims to raise awareness of the nuclear as intimately present. If we follow philosopher and ecologist uh, Tomothy, uh, Timothy Morton, nuclear contamination is one of the so-called hyper-objects that defy human comprehension and transgress our senses. Such phenomena are difficult to localize, grasp and visualize precisely because their spatial and temporal skills are disproportionate and monumental while simultaneously omnipresent. The proposed project attempts to tackle this gap in understanding by changing skill. Instead of detachment, the spectacle and the experience of the sublime, that commonly characterize nuclear imagery. Think of the, beaut the beauty of the mushroom clouds that we always see, and that's extremely beautiful. And the re representation of nuclear landscapes. Our project wishes to draw attention to invisible entities that carry the threat of contagion and to focus on bodily experience, which is socially shared and individually felt. We, we believe it is here, in the relation between ethics and skill that our film nicely links to the other presentations uh, today. Thank you, and now you can see it's eight minutes. It's a short film, the film we made about uh, this place in Vaujour. I find it really interesting that you say, what does it mean to be living in danger of radiation? Well, obviously, we should see that in your movie as well, but can you say a bit more about that? Um, yeah, because you, you cannot see it, you cannot hear it, you cannot feel it. And uh, for instance, when I was in, in, in Japan and I was in Fukushima, and it is a very beautiful area with beautiful uh, trees and nature, and then you walk in it and you realize, okay, it's not safe in here. And that was really a point of view that I thought, wow, uh, how can we live with this? And that's the same in, in France, near Faujour. You know, because it's very near Paris, that's, that's a, it's such a large city, and it was only, I think, 20, 15 or 20 kilometers outside of Paris. And, um, well, the place where we stayed with uh, the, the cameraman and, and the team, then I asked the people over there, did you know that, there or do you know that there is a place that is uh, still contaminated and things uh, will happen there? And uh, they said, oh, no, no, it's no problem for us. The wind is going the other way, so we live here safe. And, and then I realized, yeah, w w I think it's something we all have to realize, that this is very, very dangerous. 
because the, the rates of cancer are, are much higher in these parts, and that's also in Japan, but they will never relate it to the, the accident or to what is happening in Vosjur, because they say that's much later and you cannot prove that it was the, the contamination of nuclear waste that makes them sick and give them cancer, but uh, still it's, it's, well, you can see the rates are higher than at, uh, at other places. Is this a little bit the answer on your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, but maybe for Benham, because you went to Japan, but you also visited yeah. there. Do you experience the same fear among the people now maybe returning to contaminated places? Thank you. I haven't had, I haven't had much contact with people who were living there. So, uh, or I might have seen a biased group of people, but from by us, as in like the people that uh, they were selecting us to <laughs> for us to see, maybe. Uh, from the, the feeling I got was uh, that that was not the case. That was actually more like a push from uh, from the local community to want to go back. Uh, there were still bits and pieces that were un uninhabited, by the way. We also traveled through bits and pieces that uh, were still actually sort of, I'm not sure how it is right now, but back then, six years after the accident, uh, um, it was just like you're driving through a ghost town. Uh, because the radiation levels were still too high to go back to. But other people, I think there's sort of the sense of belonging to their communities there, and there was a push by the, com by the community to want to go back to the places. It was kind of the other way around. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But again, could be very much my bias view. Yeah, I, I stayed with a family uh, in, in Japan at that time uh, who had a big rice company and a very good rice company, but that was totally... Uh, down because nobody want to buy any rice anymore from over there from Fukushima <laughs> although they had tested it that it was safe so there were a lot of consequences for the people over there but really frightened um, no I was at I think at the same time or a little bit later that there were still a lot of places that it was not able to come back and now you see that a lot more people go back over there and try to start they're they're living again, but um, well, it, I think in the future we will see if if cancer will be a greater problem in these regions. I don't know. Computer cells. I have a very uh, well a te technical question from somebody who knows nothing about nuclear waste, etc. Why is the soil in Tsukushima the, radia the radiation goes down very fast, as you said, at least part of the radi radiation, and in this area it seems to be a problem for a decennia. So what is the difference? Is it because it's more enriched material? Or what's the reason? The type of particle, basically. It's a type of particle, because if it's a, it's a, it's a military facility, if I understand and said from Tunica that used to be a military facility, then you're dealing mostly with probably enriched uranium and plutonium, and both are very long-lived, and with, with decay time, sort of the half uh, 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 value time of very long time, so the time that it takes for uh, uranium and plutonium to come down to acceptable sort of levels of non-radioactive or acceptable radioactive, and you compare that usually with the same amount of uranium ore, how much uranium ore you need to actually manufacture that amount of fuel or other type of material that you're using, and when that radiation level drops back to the same level, we call that actually sort of the lifetime. Uh, for uranium plutonium, that's about 200,000 years or longer. For this, what I'm talking about is it's been a couple of years. Some, some type of uh, uh, particles might even be shorter. Thank you very much. Okay, I think it's working. I heard a breath. We breathe what we create. You've come to the right place. After the pandemic hit, I was almost expecting you. 
I'm an independent researcher, working on post-nuclear landscapes. These places and lives that have been affected by an invisible threat for decades. The iconic images of nuclear tests in remote locations far from the capitals of the testing governments are widely known. The first French atomic bomb was detonated in the Algerian desert. But few realize it was only 20 kilometers from Paris at Fort de Vajour where the core components of the bomb were developed. A Geiger counter, placed on a wall inside the fort, revealed radiation levels 30 times higher than normal. There were no full nuclear detonations in Vajour, but more than half a ton of radioactive material was blown up in about 2,000 tests. Before they were moved to one of the nuclear testing bunkers, these experiments took place outdoors, releasing uranium in the environment and creating the risk of radioactive particles inhalation and ingestion. Radiation is difficult to grasp, as it goes beyond the visual and escapes our senses altogether. Vajour's nuclear research centre was closed in 1997 and turned into an illegal dump site. In 2010, most of the area was sold to a plaster company, which is planning to transform the site into a new open-air gypsum quarry. In order to excavate the valuable gypsum, you need to cut down all the trees, strip the site bare, demolish seven hectares of buildings, and remove an estimated six million cubic meters of soil. Uranium is a heavy element, and without disturbance, radioactive dust particles eventually end up stuck to the soil. The risk of contagion becomes much higher once the particles are displaced around the site and beyond.
How can we ensure that the explosion's residue did not reach the gypsum bedrock that is planned to be mined? What do we do with all that hazardous soil? How do we demolish the remaining buildings without spreading the contaminated dust? Living with the threat of contagion has become the new normal. Radiation's invisibility allows us to hold on to our familiar daily habits, and it allows the authorities to repeatedly dismiss it. Despite the high cancer mortality rates and local protests, we remain mostly detached and indifferent. Oblivious to our human affairs, radioactive dust leaks and escapes. It passes through the environment and comes intimately close. I'm glad we managed to see that <laughs> and yeah. hear it. Um, one question for Tinika um, before we hear from the final speaker, and then we can come back. Is there anything? Uh, well, I have a question then. If, uh, I'll she, she oh, sorry. Um, why did you choose this rather scientific, dry way of speaking for the voiceover? I was wondering. Um, yeah, because it was very difficult for me to use a voiceover to tell the story and not only to show. I made a short version of it with no sound, so you, you uh, with sound, but not with a voiceover. But um, I had to discuss it. Uh, we were two of us, and um, in the end, it, it was better to give some more information because uh, about the gypsum company and all that kind of thing. If you just only see the film and you didn't hear my uh, what I told you, then it's completely like, what what is this about? So that was the reason that we choose for uh, the voiceover. Great, thank you. We'll have time for more questions later on. Our final speaker is Romy Decker, who works for the Rathenau Institute. Uh, Romy works specifically on societal issues related to controversial technologies, including radioactive waste. Um, democratic decision-making and digitization and data governance in the energy transition. And she'll discuss with us um, developments in radioactive waste policy and current challenges for the Netherlands, um, specifically how the Ratenau Institute is using public participation to inform decision-making processes around radioactive waste. I think that's right. So welcome, Romy, mm -hmm. and yeah, let's uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I will dive a bit more in the Dutch current situation, but uh, before I will take you through some historical developments that d 
determined where we are at the moment in the Netherlands and why we have the policy we have. Um, but to start, I started working on this project in 2019. And for me, like radioactive waste and nuclear energy uh, debates and also um, resistance among society wasn't really my generation. So uh, it was kind of a new topic, but what something that really appealed to me was the long-term intergenerational aspect of nuclear waste and especially radioactive waste. Um, which I will also discuss a bit later on. So to start, um, at the Rathenau Institute, we have been asked by the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management to come up with an advice in 2024 on how to organize decision making on the long-term management of radioactive waste and how to engage the public within this decision making. Um, so we still have two more years roughly to go and I will share some preliminary insights and uh, discuss what we are doing at the moment and the challenges that we are facing. Um, and I'm also curious about what you are thinking of it. So going back to the 50s, so after the Second World War, nucle nuclear technologies needed a new image. Um, uh, they were associated with uh, war uh, nuclear bombs. And uh, the United States came up with the Atoms for Peace program, which was a program to um, advocate for the uh, yeah, peaceful application of nuclear technologies. And then Dutch government um, also applied this program and organized uh, or informed the public in general, but also organized an exhibition, which you see on the left, and uh, it was called Het Atom, so the atom, promoting all peaceful applications of uh, nuclear technologies. And it took uh, a decade or so, a bit more, until the first nuclear reactors were built in the Netherlands. So on the picture you see the building of PETA, and PETA, there uh, was a nuclear reactor for research uh, built, uh, later on also for the production of medical isotopes used to uh, find and treat cancer. Um, and around the 70s, we uh, developed the first two, uh, and also the only two, nuclear power plants in the Netherlands. One of them is in Dodewaard, which we shut down just before the turn of the century. And one of them is in Borsele, in the province of Zeeland. And that one is still operational. And as mentioned in the introduction, we are currently discussing, and I think we decided upon lengthening its uh, lifetime. Um, at in the beginning of kind of the rise of the nuclear sector, radioactive waste wasn't really an issue. Uh, we stored it on ground, we buried it, and we also disposed of it in the deep sea. Um, but that did not take long. So around, um, yeah, during the 70s, uh, but also the 80s, there were more protests through Europe, and I think also the world, uh, about the dumping uh, of radioactive waste in the deep sea. Uh, and this also led to a complete ban of dumping a low level, intermediate level, but also high level radioactive waste in the sea in 83. Um, so uh, there were also some um, nuclear accidents like uh, Harrisburg, but also uh, Fukushima, no, not Fukushima, was later on, Chernobyl, uh, which really influenced the public sentiment about nuclear energy. And not only the sentiment about nuclear energy changed, but also the sentiment about radioactive waste, which is often entangled in public debates, as you uh, probably all uh, have noticed. So one of the things was that we couldn't uh, dispose of the radioactive waste in the sea anymore, but we still had high-level radioactive waste. Some of it we sent to uh, France, but also England during that time to for reprocessing. So that's a way to uh, recycle a part of the uh, spent fuel, but also to reduce its lifetime. Um, and we had to look for other ways to deal with this waste. Uh, and at the moment, and also currently, uh, the best possible way is s viewed by international experts and uh, governments as well as geological disposal. So the Netherlands, went on and tried to investigate this option. And we announced uh, the test drillings in the northern part of the Netherlands to investigate the salt domes that we have there. 
but this led to broad societal uh, resistance, uh, not only amongst local residents, but also uh, public administrators and companies alike. And so far there hasn't been any test drilling in the Netherlands uh, as of yet, while we still are, uh, yeah, we still have some waste that we have to deal with. So also during this time, the uh, opposition against nuclear energy rose, while at the same time our government wanted to expand the amount of nuclear energy in the energy mix. So they decided upon a broad societal discussion on, on the energy mix, so that's not only fo focused on nuclear energy but broader, uh, but it did went quite a lot um, on nuclear energy but also on radioactive waste. What you see here is one of the sessions in Amsterdam, which wasn't very busy, <laughs> as you can see. And that was also one of the challenges of the broad societal discussion to really engage people. And a way to do it was a slogan of the government that said, energy, too important to be left to the experts alone. Um, in the end, a committee advised the government to keep the current, or at that moment, the uh, nuclear power plants open, but to not expand the uh, amount of nuclear energy more, but the government decided to still go through with plans on, plans on building more nuclear power plants, but then um, uh, Chernobyl happened and the plans went off the table for, I think, quite a long time. Um, in 1984, the Dutch government first formulated an explicit policy on how to deal with our radioactive waste. And in this, also given in with the uh, local opposition to uh, test drillings in the northern part of the Netherlands, we decided upon building an above-ground storage facility for all, all categories of waste, a centralized storage facility, uh, for a period of 50 to 100 years. And this was in 84, and the 50 to 100 years uh, is has been reaffirmed in the national program of 2016 and there it became at least a hundred years so it seems like every decade they stay at least a hundred years um, and uh, there were also new policy principles mentioned which is minimization and safe management uh, which also influenced how the radioactive waste was managed uh, the above-ground storage facility was constructed by the COVRA, the Central Organization for Radioactive Waste, and it's also located in uh, the province of Zeeland, nearby the still-running power plant. Um, currently, all policy is documented in the National Program for Radioactive Waste. This one is uh, 2016, and in 2025 we will have an update of this one. Um, and it sets out the main policy principles for our radioactive waste management. The first one is minimization of the production of radioactive waste. And one of the ways waste this is done is that you have to have a permit to use nuclear technology and to produce radioactive waste. And it has to be justified. So one way or the other, it has to have a societal, economical or otherwise benefits to society. And then you can have a license to um, uh, use nuclear technologies. Then you still have the safe management of radioactive waste. The other one, and I think that's also particularly interesting for our discussion today, is that there shouldn't be an unreasonable burden on the shoulders of future generations. And waste producers are responsible for the costs of its management. And I think that's similar to what you said. In the Netherlands, it's uh, organized that if I'm a waste producer, I bring my waste to the COVRA. And once it's behind the COVRA's doors, they are responsible for the managing of the waste. And I pay the COVRA for managing it. Um, so that's how responsibilities are organized here. And the COVRA is an NV. I don't know the... English word for <laughs> it. Uh, but th the f uh, Ministry of Finance is uh, so um, Andeel Houder. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that was also said in the national program is that we uh, kind of a rough time buff. So around 2100, we will decide up on a disposal method in which we foresee its geological disposal, but we will have a definite de decision on this in 2100. And the construction of the disposal facility should be around 2130. So I don't know 
how old you all are, but I, you can imagine that we are all not there anymore, which also makes it very challenging to organize public participation because often in public participation, the public concerned, so the those most affected by a decision are to be engaged in public participation, but the public concerned with the disposal facility are not even born yet. Uh, so that makes it quite kind of a challenging um, yeah, um, task to organize public participation. And in thinking about organizing decision making, the national program uh, introduces three requirements. Uh, the first one is reversibility, and which is operationalized and also with the, I think this is, uh, yeah, developed by a lot of international organizations. On which, yeah, I'm there. <laughs> Uh, the uh, NEA and the IAEA, um, that it should be step-by-step -step decision making. And in each step, you should look at where are we at the moment? Is this still what we as a society want? If not, we should adjust our steps, reverse or choose another path. And this is also a way to make sure that future generations aren't uh, left with a decision we made that they can't change anymore. This also brings challenges. So if you can reverse every decision you make, how can you even make steps forward? Another one, and related to this, is retrievability and passive safety. So um, the consensus is that uh, for a safe disposal method for the long term, passive safety is needed. And that's also why uh, most of the, or um, why uh, geological disposal is seen as the best way to deal with radioactive waste because it assures once you've closed it off completely that there's a, a situation of passive safety that you no don't need active monitoring anymore and you can imagine that now um, a lot of us didn't see it coming that ukraine was in a war uh, so also geological uh, stability or um, uh, like uh, stability of um, countries, it's not a given um, for such a long period. Often they say around 300 years of uh, stability of a country you can assume, but even then. So that's why they think passive safety is very important also to not put future, future generations with uh, unreasonable burdens. But it's also important that if something goes wrong or there are developments uh, that give a reason to take back the waste or maybe recycle it or you see other applications for it that you can retrieve it or if something uh, safety or risk related is going on and the netherlands says we want retrievability but we haven't decided upon the complete terms yet so we don't know the period of retrievability and this should be something discussed within the decision making process and the public participation process but there are also a lot of intergenerational aspects about this. So for example, if you look at France, they uh, decide for, I think, five generations. So they plan to close down their facility in 2150. And you can imagine that's quite a long time already. But Germany decided upon a period of 500 years. And if you then consider passive safety, then yeah, that's it gives quite some challenges. Some people think that the European Commission won't be that happy about this period. Uh, and we as the Netherlands also um, got some questions about our own long-term decision-making process of 100 years. So can we make sure that the future generations won't be um, put with unreasonable burdens? So one of the easy challenges that we are now facing is how to organize such a decision-making process uh, and also how to engage the public in this. Um, and we uh, have been working on that since 2019. And our advice will be going into two parts. So the first part is that decision-making takes place within an institutional setting. And it is not only something that happens here in The Hague, but this is a more broader democratic process in which society, science and technology, and laws and regulations are also involved. And they all together shape the decision-making process. And we, are, we have been looking at this institutional setting, um, this, there its strengths and its weaknesses. And we are 
in the upcoming year going to um, go into dialogue with experts and stakeholders and sometimes citizens on how to strengthen the ecosystem. And part two will be concretely about identifying the building blocks for decision making, but also instructions on how to deal with the building blocks. So organizing decision making on such a complex topic also asks questions on wh when to decide what, with whom, um, in what way, and uh, at what moment in time. And also taking into co consideration mm -hmm. uh, the aspects of no putting no unreasonable burden on future generations, what procedural justice is, if you are talking about a topic like this. And some extra challenges that we have to address uh, in our advice is, for example, how to come up with criteria for search locations, how to organize a knowledge landscape that, that not only provides our current um, generation with enough knowledge to organize decision making, but also make sure that future generations have the knowledge to uh, establish and close off a repository specify the role of, the of, of public participation, elaborate on the requirements for reversibility. So what does it mean to have such a principle? What does it mean and how you organize decision making? How can you make uh, your governance approach more adaptive and step by step? Um, and also to define the optimal period for retrievability. So these are just some of the challenges that we are addressing in our advice and uh, currently working on. And if you are interested, we have a website, unfortunately it's in Dutch, uh, but we uh, really uh, would like to answer any more questions about it. Okay, let's have one quick question for Romy and then we'll also have time, we'll have a break and then have more of a panel discussion afterwards. But any, uh, any questions for Romy first? Yes, let me bring you the microphone. Uh, thank you for this talk about uh, the decision making. One of the main questions for me would be uh, how do you organize, uh, maybe that's not part of the, the, the project, but how do you organize the organization that then lives for a thou hundred years? Is that also part of, uh, you talk a lot about indeed the decision making, but I can imagine that you also have to have an idea of what kind of organization maybe you're talking about. Is that something that you or your colleagues also think about? Uh, yes, um, we do. Um, in the Netherlands, we have the COVRA, and the COVRA is end responsible for organizing um, our geological disposal. So they are currently responsible, but will also be in the future. So that's one of the organizations of which we can expect that will be there in 100 years from now. But we look also at what type of institutions do you need to organize such a long-term decision-making process. Yeah. Um, and so, Romy, when you were talking about this idea of not putting an unreasonable burden on future generations, um, could you say more about what that, right now, what the understanding of that is? Because it seemed to me like what you were, what, it didn't seem like that was referring to the amount or the waste itself but rather the procedures or organization or monitoring that would have to go into keeping it safe over time. But I'm not sure if I'm understanding that correctly, if it's only about the kinds of work that future generations would have to do to keep themselves safe, or if it also pertains to like not <laughs> creating waste in the first place that they're then living in a world with. Yeah. Um, so, one of the principles we have that really addresses whether or not we uh, produce more waste at the moment is minimization. And this is operationalized as that the use of nuclear technology should be justified. Uh, but what justified really means is not really operationalized. Uh, so quite a lot is being approved uh, to do. And you see it now with the discussion on new nuclear power plants. So when we started this project in 2019, the discussion on nuclear energy wasn't as uh, present at this moment. So um, if I would go to a, um, a birthday party and I would 
tell that I was working on radioactive waste, everyone would look at me like, why? And if you tell it now, then they're discussing nuclear energy and whether or not we should pursue it. So there's a difference between the waste we already have and how we deal with it and the future type of waste in, in which about which I think also, and I'm looking at Benham, we are going to have a big uh, public discussion in the upcoming years because our government wants two nu new nuclear power plants. Um, and yeah, under what conditions do we think that's acceptable? Thank but you. Yeah. If uh, I may uh, yeah. Add, 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 add a little bit to that from, from an ethics point, uh, point of view, because the, the, the minimalization is also sort of one of the sort of ethically laden principles. Uh, the other principle that Romy was referring to, a lot of these come actually from the ICRP publications. Uh, uh, it's called the justification principle. Justification principle basically says that when you're uh, introducing radiation, you're doing radiation activity. You're doing anything that produces radiation that could expose someone to radiation, you need to come up with a justification for it. And you need to make sure that you're uh, optimizing actually radiation levels. So to the extent possible, and there is a third level uh, principle that calls a dose limit. Every individual should be exposed to a level that is as li little as possible, and there are certain sort of thresholds. So it's a combination of this, but going to your question, the nuclear community doesn't consider, don't con uh, doesn't consider actually these principles as principles reflect on the desirability of nuclear energy. It's very much about, you now we have this waste, we want to actually deal with it, uh, or it comes from, from medical practices. If you are considering nuclear medicine, is it justified that you're considering nuclear medicine? Or if you want to reduce radiation levels in some place? So these are how the principles are being sort of applied. And, uh, and many of these principles are, uh, to make it a little bit more philosophical, actually very utilitarian, uh, or at least consequentialist thinking in terms of, we need to make sure that there is more benefits and there is, than there is burden, and how do we com actually compare burdens and benefits? In which unit do we express it in money or not? So it gets, it's very interesting that ethics is in the fabrics of thinking about radiation, even though very, uh, of very uh, seldom it's been called ethics, but ethics is very much deeply ingrained in the fabrics of a lot of thinking about radiation. Excellent, thank you. Okay, I see a question. Perhaps to make the uh, ethical question more, oh, more uh, deontological. Uh, so there was, you, you said there's, this, there, there's a plan to organize a public debate, but of course there's one part of the public who cannot be there, uh, the, the future generations. So are there any um, ways to represent those future generations? Perhaps we can come up with something, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so this is, I think, a discussion going on in almost every climate debate. <laughs> How can we represent future generations in the decisions we are making today? So I think we are currently working on a, a generatietoets, a generation assessment on how every decision we make within policy impacts future generations. There are also future generation committees, I think, in Scotland as well. Um, but we are also uh, having this challenge. So what does this mean for organizing public participation? So who should be engaged and how to engage them? And sometimes you see, for example, that environmental organizations say we represent future generations but you can also have someone of the nuclear energy uh, sector saying well no we represent future generations so who represents them and how to incorporate it so for us it's quite a challenge but i don't know if yeah there have been experiments there have been inter different approaches to different experiments also assigning committees that think on behalf of future generations take that it's pretty much the generation test so the generation uh, and there have been different approaches in different parts of the world, assigning, and, and there's been also uh, art, uh, and particularly actually novels, there's been a lot of thinking, I'm actually particularly thinking about the Ministry of Future, uh, that, that novel that really thinks about actually how do you sort of represent the interests of, interest of the ones who don't exist, and it becomes very sort of fuzzy because what do they want, how do we know what they want, how far in the future, how far in the future are we going to care to offer protection, is it exactly the same protection we are offering as a different protection? Think about long-lived waste that is going to, long to live around for a couple of hundreds of thousands of years, depending on your de definition of radiation level, up to one million years even. That's five times as much as our species has, has lived on the Earth. So then, then things become much more sort of profoundly complex to answer. Um, 
but the, the essential of your question remains. How do we represent non-existing people? Uh, and how do we ensure that the interest of people is ensured whose interest we don't even know? on this um, so what I showed in like 50 60 years ago we thought it acceptable to dispose of radioactive waste in the sea and that isn't something we should we would do at the moment so also think about what is an acceptable solution also changes through time um, as we can see also with the public sentiment see one two three. Oh, okay does it work? Than I it's working, okay. Um, I found that we are maybe missing or uh, not considering an important piece of technology we have nowadays, which are the burners, certain reactors that are able to burn, not like chemically burn, but to uh, deal with high level uh, nuclear waste, such as plutonium or americium, post uh, uh elements. Basically, you put them in this special kind of reactor and you are demolishing them with neutrons so that they become closer to medium level nuclear waste. This, I guess, has implications on both the organizational part. So in the future in which we have plenty of these reactors or enough, we could not have the problem of high level nuclear waste anymore. And also about the ethical part, because then the, med the medium level nuclear waste is produced by medicine and no one has doubts about the ethics of that, I assume. And so if the nuclear plant doesn't produce any more high-level nuclear waste, that changes a bit the picture, I guess. What do you think about this news, let's say? I'm not sure if I follow entirely the, the technical reasoning, because there are indeed type of reactors, even conventional reactors could burn some, some of the plutonium produced. Borsal is running right now on MOX, uh, partially MOX, which is mixed oxide fuel, which is partially plutonium, partially uranium, and the same plutonium is actually that come from borsal, so there's some reusing going on there. But it it's doesn't even out. It's not like every all the plutonium produced in borsal is used. That's one. And so even assuming that we are going to reuse everything coming out of the reactor, we still have a lot of surplus. That's one. Uh, that's another thing that's important. More importantly, there is a lot of actually plutonium all around the world unused coming from, the, uh, from the, the military facilities, but also coming from the dismantled warheads. A lot of plutonium, and, and that's one of the reasons that, for instance, United States moved away from reprocessing, reusing, and producing even more plutonium, because there's a lot of unused plutonium, but also highly enriched uranium. There are ways for using that as fuel, but it's, it's not so easy that if we do that, you can get rid of all of it very easily. At the end of the day, you'll have to deal with one way or the other some kind of geological disposal. So the ethical problem will, will unfortunately remain. But there are some countries who reason, and you are also alluding to that yourself, uh, americium, curium, there are methods actually that, that we could also get rid of the type of waste and reduce the waste life to a couple of hundreds of years. We can do that on paper and also shown in facilities, sort of technical facilities, super expensive, first of all. Uh, builds, it requires building even newer reactors, more reactors, so even more technical it, uh, uh, sort of investments, so that's part of the, the, the price. But still, you could argue that we have the ethical obligation to do so. Um, as a matter of fact, I wrote a dissertation 12 years ago and defended at this university arguing in favor of uh, transmutation. Uh, as right, if you want to argue for in favor of nuclear energy, that's the only right way to go. Uh, that's at least my argument back then a little bit naive because I don't think so that any country would pose for, uh, opt for that at this moment. The, the only country that came the closest to that was Japan, who was sort of considering what is popularly called plutonium economy. So reusing, recycling, and multiple recycling of plutonium so that you could actually reuse as much as sort of energy stored in the material after recycling. But then Fukushima happened, and the whole idea sort of plutonium economy, multiple recycling went out of the window. First, and did you have a question? No. Okay. Then I think Ashish had a question. And then yeah. Is this a mic? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, th thank you, all three speakers, for your interesting uh, presentations. And uh, my question is: um, um, If we look at look at uh, the, uh, I mean, different countries in the world have made uh, uh, carbon or greenhouse gas emissions reductions pledges that 
you know, in some cases, uh, they're aiming for net zero by 2050 or 2060, uh, something like that. But um, the analysis by the IPCC itself shows that even if those pledges and commitments were to be met, we're still on track for like 2.4 or 2.7 degrees Celsius temperature rise. And uh, at that kind of temperature level rise, uh, uh, we have to anticipate uh, major societal uh, breakdown, uh, collapse, uh, major disruptions. So uh, as we're facing that kind of future uh, in the not so long term, uh, do you think, how would we uh, ever be able to safely manage and operate uh, nuclear power infrastructure? Um, because we're going to have to deal with uh, major disruptions with uh, food, scarcity, food scarcity, uh, droughts and floods and, and things like that. So uh, uh, what views uh, do you have uh, about this? This future <laughs> that we're facing. It's a very difficult one, Rob is going to answer. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I know the COPA um, who is uh, conducting safety cases, and a safety case is a method in which you collect all uh, current data knowledge on a geological disposal method, so either in clay or in salt, for example. And in their models, they too do take into account sea level rise. Uh, but still, this also has a societal impact, of course, and the stability of governments and democracies. and. I don't know in how far they take this into account in their models, um, but this is certainly some uh, a type of insecurity that we have to deal with in governing radioactive waste. Okay, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest actually sources of disruption is human impact. I think one of the biggest challenges is that disposing of in a place that people will, won't dig it up. People in the future won't dig it up. Somebody asking actually the question about institution, mm -hmm. which institution, how do you pass on the knowledge the monitoring that is substantially different in different countries, for instance. The biggest challenge is that how do you communicate with future far, far in the future in a way that it wouldn't be an invitation to dig it up, but more like a sign, please don't come close. And there's a lot of interesting sort of experiments, and again, artists have done amazing work here, uh, sort of how do you actually come up with something that gets across the message, don't come close, yet wouldn't be considered as an invitation to an average arch archeologist. Uh, so stay away here from here, but do we do that in languages? Do we do that in institutions? In the Netherlands, there is this, this firm belief, and I think it's a very good one. We need to actually sort of pass on knowledge in institutions. Hence, COPA will be there probably also for many more decades to come, even probably beyond that. But I think, uh, I, 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 I don't believe, especially when you think about deep, uh, deep geological, that, uh, that more like climate disruptions are going to be a bigger challenge. I think that human disruption is, is going to be even a bigger challenge than climate disruption. But, uh, can you moving away. Uh, uh, moving away, not, I mean, from, uh, well, uh, not just thinking about nuclear waste, let's say, uh, about the, the nuclear infrastructure, uh, current nu nuclear infrastructure itself, because um, we saw that this summer that uh, because of the extreme heat wave, uh, rivers in France dried up, and then you know they had to sort of shut down or you know like temporarily halt uh, some nuclear power plants. So you know, also those kinds of things that are related to like uh, present day operation. I think that's uh, absolutely as a remark. I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's very important to think ahead. It's also very important to think ahead in terms of uh, potential new new. Tsunami waves, for instance, because these near reactors, most of them are built on shorelines for a good, for the reason, because we need access to fresh water, which is potentially a risk. And every time, and that's, it's sometimes called a paradox of safety. Every nuclear disaster makes the water a little bit safer because we know how to avoid such a disaster in the future. After Chernobyl, we started actually developing our reactors in a completely different way. We moved past, we moved away from active safety to passive safety. How do you build a reactor that doesn't require a an operator that has to pay attention all the time. How do you build a reactor that could respond to an event? The, the Fukushima reactors responded to the earthquake. They shut down themselves, actually. The problem wasn't the, the earthquake. The problem was actually sort of accumulation. It was a perfect storm, accumulation of things that came after each other. And eventually, in the risk calculation, they didn't, they didn't build the, the seawalls tall enough. And that was actually when things went south. Does it work? Yeah. I have a question for Tineke. 
Um, you obviously choose a completely different perspective. I mean, we're talking about decision-making institutions and so on. And I was curious to hear um, how did people react and do you think this was a good means with a movie to, um, I don't know, make sure public engagement is yeah, arranged, how should I say that? Um, yeah, I think that, that is always difficult with art because you don't want to give solutions or to say we have to do this or that. You, uh, I really want to create awareness so that you think about it, like what, what can happen and, and what consequences are there. Um, and we want to make it very close. So, um, uh, like in the film is said uh, also that it is always something far away, but that in the end it is, it's very close. And it's, uh, it's also about the ethics of responsibility that I already talked with her about, like, uh, we can say, okay, the, the institutions or uh, the government or the companies, they are responsible. But I also think uh, all of us uh, are responsible because um, when we want to use a lot of energy, then, okay, there has to be solutions, what kind of energy, and if it's not good with the fuel and all the other things, then nuclear energy is, is the most clean energy we can uh, make. But um, still then, there are so, there are so much risk, and, and, and then especially for future generations. We, we, we now we will have a good time with each other and, and grow, 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 but in the end, uh, it's the future generation who has to deal with it. And, and even what you said is very important, that because of the climate change, the, the, uh, it's another risk which is extra on, on everything what, what is already uh, a great problem with it. So what, what I try to do uh, as an artist is to, to, to give this other perspective and to make it feel for, for everyone itself very much like, uh, who am I? And, you know, it ends with the water you drink and, and so you, you deal also with it. But great, thanks. Okay. You're welcome. Maybe a related question for Tinika, or for anyone, but maybe especially Tinika. Uh, in all of these the in pre these presentations, it really just strikes me how quickly it seems like public opinion changes. So from Venom, we hear that okay, yeah, we all experienced Fukushima, and we saw immediately this sh the shutdown in Japan and in Germany as well of nuclear facilities and now <laughs> it's 2022 and other things have happened in the world and that trend has reversed in a lot of cases yeah and i was struck also with with your film how i mean and, and this parallel was drawn out in the film as well but with with covid and the k95 mask and it it feels sort of familiar even though we are in a landscape i've never been in and i've never and so i wonder like can we use things like this, like your film or other kinds of um, artistic methods to maybe <laughs> help us think longer term or, or not lose sight of the things that we've kind of learned or uh, it just, it seems like there's such a back and forth and it doesn't seem like there's a gaining of yeah, I don't know, maybe this is kind of cynical, but it just doesn't, it doesn't feel like a development. It feels like swinging of a pendulum, rather. And I wonder if, there are, uh, if, if art or artistic practices give us a way of reflecting or something that other deliberative practices maybe miss out on or are too kind of susceptible to, uh, yeah, political or public, uh, uh, yeah, maybe. Do you have an idea of what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah, I have an idea, but I, I think the first thing what uh, strikes me is that that um, the the public, the people you reach, is another public with uh, art uh, than uh, the, the scientific world and 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 that kind of thing. So th that's one of the important reasons why it's so good to to see uh, in another way. And um, when you talk about it and you read about it in the papers, you know, not everyone is reading it, but film and other kinds of artistic ways to to show your uh, perspective on on topics. 
um, it's really important uh, to do that, and uh, I th I, th I think it really helps. And in the in the other way, it's about imagination. The the question about um, do can you imagine how future generations uh, live with it? Well, that was also something I tried to show in my film. You know, by coloring it in a strange uh, way, and that you have the idea you live in a city which is totally without people anymore and how uh, how will we deal with that so and and of course it it's very fu <laughs> well in a way good that uh, things happen now that we all realize we have to do something and uh, also about the problem uh, how can we for future generate how can you think for future generations i think it's very important to make young people critical uh, and, and make parents critical, so you know that there is a lot of discussion, and uh, that can also help for future generations, I think. But art is an extremely nice way to see, to, to make it not very heavy, you know, but that you go out of the, the, the cinema and think, well, what, what, I, what do I have to do with it? That, that, that's maybe the main point. Or, or an exhibition. Is is a little bit an answer on your question? Yeah, no, okay. I, I don't think it was a question that's a... Okay. No. no, that's very, yeah, that's nice. Um, anyone, final questions? Wrap up, I think we're past our time. Oh, I see one, sorry. Uh, on where is the major discussion among the Dutch society going on? Is that, because I don't see many people on the streets, but is that in social media, is it in the newspapers, where, or is there any, and if yes, where is it? On what topic? On uh, nuclear waste. New, yeah, or... Or energy. Um, well, <laughs> it's related, right? Yeah, I think on energy, uh, Benham is the person to ask. Um, also, nuclear energy, there's a lot of discussion going on on the desirability of how fast moving and moving away from fossil fuel to what. Nuclear energy has become uh, an important topic increasingly, actually, the last couple of months. I'm not sure if there is much discussion going on about nuclear waste. There is sort of some sort of coming up and going down. Let's assume that we are not leaving the building. No. <laughs> it's tough. I, uh, but you can you can say, say, say judge that better. Is there any serious discussion going on nuclear waste? No, but that's also related to the um, the the phase where we in in related to decision making. So if you are going to make a decision around 2100, then why have a big political debate or societal debate at this moment? But what we do see is uh, that this also changed. So the Rathenau Institute did a, a research on public participation about radioactive waste management in 2014-15. And then the public said, well, um, at this moment in time, we are not interested in discussing this topic. Now it's something for the experts. Um, and in a later stage, um, uh, yes. Uh, but the world changed since 2015. So I can imagine that also now discussing two nu new nuclear power plants, that the topic of radioactive waste is back on the agenda. So it's even mentioned in our Regeer Accord, um, where they say that they're going to find a acceptable or safe solution for radioactive waste, but it's not elaborated on what it's meant with, with that. Um, so yeah, for now it's, um, it's returning on the agenda, but still very limited. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think we should thank our three speakers, and um, I think we should conclude it here. This was a nice question to end with. Um, <laughs> so yeah, let, join me in thanking our speakers, and I hope you will join us for the following uh, Studium Generale event. Um, but for now, thank you, Tinika and Venom and Romy, for your expertise and answering our questions, and thank everyone here for your participation and your great questions. Thank you.